welcome another episode at the show and thanks for joining us we're here with sarah francis gordon um who's the editorial manager at the journal psicologia iberoamericana at the university universitat iberoamericana in mexico city mexico well could have said that in spanish as well but <laughs> welcome sarah <laughs> feel free to rephrase and repronounce correctly where you're working and what you're doing. <laughs> so I work at a bilingual journal, which we accept articles in English and Spanish, mm -hmm. and it's called Psicología Iberoamericana, or in English, Psychology Iberoamericana. And the journal is now 35 years old. It is Ooh. as old as me. Um, oh. And I work, <laughs> I'm 35, and I work at Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. Um, and it is a Jesuit university, mm -hmm. so which means a private Catholic university. So uh, the university was founded in 1943, and it's one, it's the oldest, I think, private university in the country. And Je there are Jesuit universities across the US, Canada, Asia, Spain, uh, well, South America. There are a lot in Argentina, Brazil, Chile. Colombia, Ecuador, Paraguay, Peru, Uruguay, Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And so we're just part of that family. Also in Africa, and other parts of the world, Asia, Europe, anywhere? In India, Indonesia, one in Japan, in Tokyo, Lebanon, Philippines, South Korea, Central America, mm -hmm. Europe, none in Africa that I can see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you have to be Catholic to either work at or attend the university? No. There's none. No, you definitely don't. So religious affiliation is not a requirement to work here, nor is a requirement to study. Mm -hmm. It's just a university that follows the Jesuit spirit, which is the it aims to educate students um, along the idea that your individuality is linked to your social action and your community work and how you serve others, and that is important to educate not only your mind but also your spirits and uh, sense of giving back to the community well that's so nice and makes me think about what's the purpose of research in the first place and there's probably several purposes and here we have a whole university family of a particular purpose so what are the disciplines that are that you would find in, at a jesuit or at the university where you're working in mexico city so the university we have the psychology department, which is the department I am in. Mm. We have a law department, design department, architecture department, communications. Gosh, there's everything. <laughs> we have one of the largest uh, libraries in the country. It's mm. fantastic, very beautiful. Um, what else? We have we have a neuropsychology laboratory, which is mm -hmm. fantastic. We have a lot of facilities. So do you also have life sciences represented? Like neuro? Yes. Okay. And how would that then apply to the purpose that the university is here to foster? Because life, sci well, I mean, life sciences can also be very much applied. I'm, I'm coming from a fundamental research biology angle. That's why I'm getting drawn to that question. So the question is, does the university also offer courses in fundamental research of some sort? So there are research courses. We also have a new department, which is the Department of Social Action and Social mm -hmm. Service, which uh, its purpose is to, so students during their bachelor's degree have to not only go to classes, but also be involved in social projects. All right. Um, and which is important. And we also run different projects at the university. And uh, a lot of our research is focused towards the social good. For example, at the journal that I'm working at at the moment, which is open access, mm -hmm. and there's no APCs, which is article processing charges. So you submit for free, publish for free, and that's funded by the university. And our special number, this is our, we have two numbers this year that will come out in the next month. And the one is on violence against children in mm. Mexico during the pandemic. Mm. 
and the other one is on the extended effects of criminal incarceration in Latin America. Mm. Oh. And we have contra and that one there are contributions from Argentina, Mexico, uh, where else? I can't remember at the moment. Argentina, Mexico, I think mainly. So mm. we're also looking at social issues that previously have been underrepresented, social issues that are important. Mm -hmm. And it's it's mm -hmm. interestingly or maybe not so coincidentally mm -hmm. links to your research background, which is in trauma relief, trauma as is, and violence against women research. I mean Yeah. So yes. is that Agreed. how you chose that position to work for a journal that covers also those topics? Yes. So Probably I'm working uh, where I should be because <laughs> I'm working in an institution that uh, believes in social action and the mm -hmm. social good and serving the community. Um, so, and a lot of my research before, so I did a PhD in psychology and it was on violence against women and its effects on women in the general population, not just um, survivors of violence. And then I did a postdoc in political science looking at gender and politics mostly uh, citizenship rights in Zimbabwe and same-sex relationships uh, of women in South Africa. And uh, now I'm working in Mexico <laughs> at this journal and a lot of, so obviously, uh, you know, I'm following the things I'm passionate about. So a lot of the stuff we publish and a lot of our special numbers are about uh, social issues that have been underrepresented. Mm. For example, during the pandemic, we had a fantastic issue, which was on uh, the psychosocial impacts of, of COVID-19 uh, in the Mexican population and was a special member. And we had contributed from all over Mexico. And we had an event just to find out what is the psychological impact of COVID-19 mm. um, and all the research that was going through there. So we do a lot of important things, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um what what I'm wondering now is how is the transition for you? How long have you been working at the journal? Sorry, I think you might have mentioned. I've been working here four years and one month. Okay, that's that's some time. So um, so how is it now to be in a different? So from being an active researcher, looking at the actual data mm -hmm. and processing the data, to now collecting and curating and assessing other researchers' work through the journal. Like, would it be possible for you to explain a bit how that works for you, like to, like to, to address the topic that you're so obviously passionate about from a different angle, that makes sense. So I love research. And as you were saying earlier, I am a generalist, as mm -hmm. in I love all aspects of research. So during my PhD and my postdoc and my master's, I undertook research. I did the data, the research design, the data collection, the data analysis. I even did all my transcriptions myself, uh, the write-up, the thesis, the publishing. So I love all aspects. So to be involved in the editorial side is very interesting. And very enlightening as well, because a lot of uh, researchers, you know, write a journal article and they submit their work and then they don't know what happens after that. It disappears mm -hmm. behind the curtain of journals or peer review. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to know everything that goes on, you know, the peer review process, yeah. uh, the editorial stages, what happens before production, what goes into creating a journal article, uh, what are digital persistent identifiers? Why are they important? Yeah. Uh, and all the different aspects that as researchers we take for granted and we get angry when our, <laughs> when our articles aren't back from peer review after a month. Mm. And we don't realize that, you know, there are people I frantically assume. running yeah. around trying to find anyone to review it. And we're trying to, it's double blind. Our journal, we use double blind peer review where the author and the reviewer doesn't, they don't know who each other is. Mm -hmm. So it's completely anonymous to maintain the credibility and quality um, and prevent bias. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, we're all running around trying to do this. And so it's nice to know all the processes that go on behind the curtains. Mm. So some aspects of that we just recently um, co-shared, a uh, guide for researchers, what happens during peer review. So once you submit, and as you address that now as the mystic sphere and the manuscript is now gone in the hands of the editors and reviewers and publishers. Um, yeah. So we will place a link to that guide as well. But then some other aspects that you also mentioned, like the whole typesetting, layouting, all of that is a whole lot of work that's going on in the background. Um, so yeah. Um, okay, so bilingual, running a bilingual journal, isn't it double the amount of work? It would, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I do a lot of work. All right. <laughs> So the journal accepts, so for example, the website of the journal, you can toggle between English and Spanish and every page has an English and Spanish version, depending. Mm -hmm. And you can submit your article by the system in English or in Spanish, depending on what you've written. And every issue, the editorial is published in English and Spanish, both side by side, so that uh, anyone can read the editorial. Mm -hmm. And then we publish English articles if we receive them. Mostly we publish Spanish articles. Uh, occasionally we receive English articles. I okay. wish we would receive more English articles. But yes. there are, oh, so we could publish them because okay. we accept English articles. But, right. uh, okay, so just to balance the ratio. To balance the ratio, right. because obviously in Mexico um, to publish in English is an extra amount of work. We know this whole English only Anglophone journal world, you know, where you have to publish in English, you want to have it translated. And then when you go through peer review, you've got to, when you do your revisions, you've got to have someone help you edit it. And it's additional work mm. um, and an additional burden. Uh, so often we receive just Spanish, trans just Spanish uh, submissions. Next year, we will launch a project uh, to try to boost the English submissions. So we are still working on that mm. because obviously as much as we hate it, people read English articles and they have greater discoverability and in, in terms of international reach, even though it is you know, the discriminatory language practices in Anglophone journals are well documented. Mm. We just had a discussion also on record for this podcast. So by the time this is published, um, you'll probably already be able to access the other one as well about mm -hmm. translating research and the opportunities drawbacks benefits whatever um that comes with it it's extra work for sure somebody needs to pay for that extra amount of work that goes in also the assessment of the there's always some interpretation that comes with translation or recontextualization mm -hmm. where information may be added or lost in the process mm -hmm. um so I just personally feel that it's also important to nurture the culture of research in the mother tongue of the community or the home language or the regional local language. But also, of course, we all agree that it's necessary to have like, it's not that we have one lingua franca and Spanish and Portuguese are huge language groups in themselves, but we need to find ways with these global challenges to cross like to, to exchange information across these language groups and barriers. And they're interesting. I think you're like, you're, your journal has a long record of, a long track record of facilitating bilinguality of some sort, even if it's just the summary, but it's an access point. But the question now that can and I, I always, I do care for, let's at least translate the title metadata and the summary or abstract. And that's already quite an amount of work to do, but it's so beneficial because uh, it often allows also to look at our own research in, like, from another perspective. Isn't it funny that uh, that my company is called Access to Perspectives? <laughs> <laughs> Coincidentally, mentioning that, um, but yeah, it's like, and oftentimes it also allows to see it from a different angle again. And then also to open up the results to the regional communities and stakeholder groups. And then also in Anglophone institutions where there's research to be done in 
other world regions. I personally think it should be obligatory and a default to translate in that target region languages one or more. But it's not. I mean, not 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 to um, not to, to a significant amount from what I've seen. But maybe that's something we can also advocate for increasingly so. So, <laughs> so what do you think would be like? Okay, so you. Basically, from you wanting to receive more submissions from the Spanish speaking community in Mexico and other regions, other countries in Latin America. So, you feel would like the benefit would also be, obviously be to for them to gain more visibility, to access more of like the Anglophone um, knowledge discourse or scholarly discourse around several topics. Um, so, you feel that. I'm not going with this. So that there's not enough of all of this, even though you facilitated already so much with the journal setup. And you do assign persistent identifiers. So in theory, the discoverability would be there even for the Spanish speaking or Spanish language articles. But then it's not being made used of use of. I think multilingualism in research is a very complex issue. And obviously having a language like English to translate um, and make science communicable between different countries is important. However, there are, how would we say, language discriminatory practices in journals, as you touched on. Um, discoverability is always an issue, I think. Um, so it's not just about, uh, publishing Horn English <laughs> because it's also about people being able to understand and read more about the research that's happening in Latin America, in Spain, in the neighboring US that is done in Spanish. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of people, a lot of researchers, when they do their literature review, they just look at the articles in English even when they're writing a literature review on a social phenomenon in Mexico. You know, they just read the articles about the migrant situation in Mexico that are published in English. Mm -hmm. And there are many articles that are published in Spanish. So it's also about the discoverability in that often, often research that is published in different languages is ignored by the English speaking community. They almost other it yeah. and don't account it. And that I feel compromises research in general Totally. So I'm, I'm with you in the belief that we need multilingualism, multilingualism mm -hmm. in research, and we need to translate more of our work. And mm -hmm. I also think the same as you that it should be ethically obligatory, like ob uh, what's the obligatory. word? It's, yes, obligatory, <laughs> ethically obligatory to um, publish research in the language in the country where the field work is done. And if you're publishing in an international journal, so if that would be English, Spanish, or if you do your field research in, I don't know, mm. it depends. In Mozambique, you publish in Portuguese and English, or mm. uh, parts of Kwazulu Natal, you publish it in Zulu and mm. English. Um, it depends. Though, mm. obviously, these are just beautiful ideals that we have, but I think it's important. That, yeah, I, think, I mean, it's researchers in different languages, and that's very much possible. I mean, the the accuracy of machine translation from Spanish to English and vice versa is astonishing. Accurate, like high. The accuracy is high. Is it how you say? It? Like it's, it's yeah. Of course, taking into account that it should always be manually um, checked for accuracy also from the research aspects because it's so specific. So I'm not saying we should 100% rely on machine translation, but it can be a gate opener, an access point. And it's just a matter of two, three mouse clicks. And then, so, so I'm saying this because you, your journal and other journals also that claim to be international have started that. So it's happening and it's just a matter of as more and more journals are embracing the practice of providing an infrastructure and interface for submitting authors to, to have yeah to have a bilingual or multilingual 
um, entry mask for their data, the title, abstract metadata, and possibly even the full article, but that's an, an amount of work we don't, I don't know, like that's, that's, a, that's a decent budget to tap into. Um, so yeah. So yeah, I was I was questioning. So like I was I was poking a little bit in that direction because if you advocate for or if you if you encourage Spanish speak the Spanish speaking community to please consider writing articles in English now, don't, don't we serve a system we want to change? True, very uh, true. It's a tightrope. You have to balance. It's sure. you have to balance on it and you have to make sure you don't go you don't only publish in English you don't only publish in Spanish it's the tightrope of trying to maintain a culture of multilingualism in research mm. the other thing is if okay so no people would still stick with you as a journal but once they flip to English don't you see it also as an as a possibility that they might leave for another English-speaking journal prestige occupied journal not saying that yours doesn't have any prestige but um, <laughs> isn't that a like yeah couldn't that happen and wouldn't that be a loss for the region as in regional scholarly infrastructure to be utilized by the community because yeah no please Andre. it's okay um I suppose we're an open access journal, so we're not reliant on APCs. So I don't think of it as so much a loss of revenue as I'm happy that researchers in Latin America are publishing in high impact journals. And I'm happy when they con contribute to low, low impact. We don't have an impact factor because we're not in Scopus at the moment, but I'm happy when they contribute to local journals as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy if people are publishing about the area and they work and making it discoverable and they're also publishing in different languages and doing whatever they can do to get their research out there. And uh, if their research is about social issues and about the general population, then if their research is more discoverable and it helps them get a research grant, which helps better serve a community mm. or better develop, I don't know, uh, medicine and in or psychological intervention or anything or, or a policy in their local country, I see that as a win for everyone. Right. Yeah. Um... I ha I heavily advocate against the journal impact factor because it's purely and exclusively prestige driven and which like but that's the only thing I want once like we can leave the discussion there and <laughs> it's just like it's funny because the person who's come up with the sort of measuring or calculating what's now known as the impact factor wrote a paper about it Eugene Garfield and he literally said. Well, he's used many sentences. Unfortunately, he didn't say in one short sentence, do not use the impact factor. But basically, what that's what the whole paper says in between each and every line. It's too complex. It's not comparable. It doesn't mean anything, the number you get. So don't get obsessed about it. Basically, what the take-home message is with many arguments that don't say that so explicitly, unfortunately. <laughs> Anyways, um, but yes, we have that. But taking your point is yes, discoverability first. This is also what we do with Epic Archive, the preprint um, server or platform with Nexus platform for African researchers. We started this to increase discoverability of African research output. And when researchers approach as well, there's also a bio archive. There's also other preprint service. Why should I submit with Epic Archive? I was like, like the, if it's, for you about discoverability only you serve us on our mission by submitting wherever just what you said like if it serves you to engage with the bioarchive community then go for it for the discoverability aspects it it actually does make a difference because different indexing platforms like scopus web of science google scholar uh the lens dimensions there's several that are now to be utilized and they all have different approaches to indexing 
Um, so, but still, as long as you have a DOI to your article, discoverability should be there one way or the other, and that's your win. But if you want to build community, either for a region, like with us, with the African Archive, or by submitting to a regional journal like yours, then you build and strengthen the community in that region or on that discipline level. And that's like for bioarchive, for biology and biosciences. So that's basically a personal choice for me. And it's good to have a diversity of options to choose from. And I'm just saying and emphasizing, and I think that we're pretty much in line, like it shouldn't matter, like prestige shouldn't be the decision factor, but rather which community serves my interests and the purpose of my research best at this point. And then the next paper can be submitted wherever else, whatever, yeah, I don't know. Because I feel journals nowadays, they, because if we have so many journals on the market, it's so confusing. And some charge APCs, others don't. And some journals are recommended or almost obligatory to submit to based um, from the incentive or policy system that the university has. So, yeah, I mean, there's a level of redundancy also where to submit to and like many journals offer the very same services or the very same scope of research interests. So wouldn't it be more, wouldn't it be better for a journal and GR is probably doing that uh, um, to, yeah, to come back to the core of like, why does the journal exist in the first place is yes, to curate content for a particular region on a range of topics and to be specific about that and not to create redundancy and compete with prestige and impact factor levels instead. I don't know. Well, just thinking out loud here. I agree with you. Also with regard to impact factors, impact factors are tied to language, you know, so the higher your impact factor, the higher the probability you only publish in English. And the higher your impact factor is, the probability is that your journal is related to a colonial institution that was uh, privileged dur during a specific time in history wow. okay. as well. Wow. So you can also think of it like that. Uh -huh. So impact factors are, you, we need to also think about why are some journals, why are the impact factors so high and what gave them the opportunities and uh, time and space to have an impact factor that high. So you also can think about it in terms of that. And you, oh. just, if we put our critical thinking cap on and we can ask ourselves how many of these journals are only published in English and how many, how many are there high, are there journals of high impact factors that publish in other languages other than English? That all are there journals with high impact factors that are only published in a language that is not English? Huh. So there's also that to consider when you look at impact factors. Um, I, I agree with you. If it's about discoverability, and it depends on your mission with your research. If your mission with your research is to get a lot of discoverability, or it is to grow a community, or it's get exposure so you can apply for a grant, mm. so you can fund a project for an intervention, and then you later use that to help a community or make a scientific discovery, then that's important. Mm. Whichever purpose your research is going, you should use. Um, and our journal, we focus on the Spanish-speaking communities, wherever they are in the world. So that's our area. So for example, on the issue that will come out in the next, we have two that are coming out in the next couple of months. Uh, we look at the extended effects of criminal incarceration for family members in Argentina, Mexico. We also look at violence against children in Mexico. Uh, a lot of our research was done during the pandemic about that. So obviously our focus is different. Mm -hmm. And we also uh, focus on multilingualism. So all our abstracts are in English and Spanish. And we try to make, we make sure that every editorial is translated into English as well. So mm -hmm. that the person who writes the editorial for that issue has some discoverability, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a manageable goal because an editorial is 
you know, maximum four pages, minimum two. So that's a manageable goal that we can do. Mm. So uh, also I think the journals need to think about what their mission is mm. and what kind of vision they have. And uh, there aren't, there aren't out of, there are only a few psychology journals in Mexico. So I feel like we're not saturating the market with mm. regard to your other comments. Um, I can't remember what your other comment was, sorry. Yeah, I also can't, but I, I don't mean to criticize or challenge you in particular, but journals in general, rather, because there's so many, well, there's literally hundreds and thousands of journals, like what, where do you start? It's funny when you go through some databases, like like the Dodge Director of Open Access Journals, mm -hmm. uh, like I often direct people there to search for a journal to publish in, and then you also have the price list on the site. And then to look at by discipline of a research topic, what there's five thousand journals on that topic, and that sounded pretty niche already. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> I know which one to choose. Mm -hmm. And I also yes, I also worry a bit that there's a lot of uh, predatory journals mm -hmm. at the moment out in the world. I'm sure you get those emails that say, dear Dr. Joe, please consider, and the English is terrible, and they uh, are asking you to publish in the upcoming number, and they mention their very high APC charge, which is always in dollars. Um, and I'm sure you get those emails. Well, not so many, because I'm not like researching on topics that are so, um, like I do research and I publish on open science primarily. So that's not so prone to phishing emails. But like predatory journals is one of my least favorite topics to talk about. Oh, sorry. Because, <laughs> no, 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 don't, please don't apologize because I feel there's so much, first of all, there's many African journals where there's decent journals and editorial teams which are heavily understaffed often and overworked, but they try their very best to serve their communities and they're often the only option where, where the researchers can publish because of peer review biases and those kinds of things. So um, so that's one thing. And then like Doaj, for example, um, the director of Open Access Journals, they also have an indexing list um, or indexing service for journals. And they actively encourage African, Southeast Asian, Latin American journals to, to apply. But then they also have quality assurance measures to be indexed, obviously. And then some of what well, this is all transparently listed on the website. But then one thing is, oh, you need a physical address, which is not so typical to have in some African countries. So Agreed. that often is a decision point not to be indexed in the Director of Open Access Journals or to be labeled as a predatory journal. Like it can go both ways. So my other... <laughs> Because like I like, what is the reason to be labeled as predatory? You name one exorbitant fees as an APCs. Let's talk about nature for a minute. How dare they to charge nine thousand five hundred pounds for per submission? Like seriously, what? <laughs> how does that make sense? No matter how high the prestige may be, like what the heck? Like and how is that not exploiting the system? Like. There was a huge uproar when they announced it. Now things have quieted down. People are just quietly accepting and finding the money and scratching it together from wherever. But how is this not predatory behavior of a service of a stakeholder in the system? Um, the other thing is <clears throat> not doing thorough peer review. Every journal on this planet has problems. You also mentioned it to find reviews because it's it's just humanly impossible to process the amounts of articles that are being submitted and need to be peer reviewed. It's just mm -hmm. the system is broken. It's not it's not functional. I mean not the academia as a whole. I wouldn't say academia as a whole is broken. It has many flaws, but we just need to accept that we need to restructure. And restructuring is happening, but <sighs> there's many high high impact factor journals that suck at peer review management. Like and not because they're so bad at it, just because the market is so thin. 
and and maybe also they don't have the right policies in place and it's not uncommon sometimes to wait not for one month is pretty quick to process a review or process but there's many instances where i heard from researchers um that they've been waiting for a year a year and a half sometimes two or three years and imagine the phd students need to graduate and they need to they need their publication out before or to graduate in the first place like who's thinking of them <laughs> and how is this predatory behavior but then who would accuse a high impact factor journal of being a predatory journal like there's a colonial aspect again like of course that's not happening like corruption is not in the west corruption you only find in africa like huh? it's everywhere it says we have different words for the same thing <laughs> so that's my take on predatory journals for you of course i know what you mean and of course there's always um people who try to take opportunity but i think it's also like we also need to mature as researchers of like to do our very own research on okay which service provider do i need to publish and to do a thorough check i mean it's not difficult to go through uh journal's website and not blindly submit to wherever I don't know, just publish where you know there's trust in the institution, which also applies to to journals and publishers. I agreed. I agree with you. Definitely. And if you want to upset a group of researchers, then you don't you can discuss religion or politics, but don't discuss APCs of nature. <laughs> Half the group will say, oh, nature does amazing things and there they have a whole oh. team of people and they pay for everything. And the other group will say, burn them to the ground. The APCs are <laughs> ridiculous. And then everyone will fight. <laughs> and no, it's also not every journal of nature under the nature in the nature family that charges such mm. high APCs. But I just question like, where is this number coming from? How do they justify? They've been called out not by other people publicly. They never responded to my knowledge. Like, what? It doesn't make sense, but people are just choking. Uh, not sure. Some are choking on it. Others are swallowing the bitter pill <laughs> and just go running with it. But it's like wherever you spend so much money is one less PhD student that you can pay for a month or two, one less undergraduate that you can provide a lab space for, one less librarian in the house, one less you know, library to, to fill with books. I mean, the money is, is in the system and if it goes only one way to the publisher, like, it's missing on the other end. Like, simple enough. Ah, okay. So, predatory. Don't worry. I will, we will, I will make this point and then we will move on to another topic. <laughs> well, one of the reasons I dislike predatory journals is that in Latin America, um, a lot of the research policies are that journals have to be open access and that you can't charge APCs because it's immoral and that we need free, uh, that research should be freely available, um, especially if it's locally produced. Therefore, there are a lot of journals you can submit to that you don't need to pay an APC. Um, and, you know, so when they send out these emails, I almost, you know, there are so many journals you could uh, submit your manuscript to and you wouldn't need to pay anything. And and also when they target uh, authors from Latin America, it's you know it's a, it's yeah. upsetting because uh, a lot of our research policies we don't there are, we submit to open access journals. So that's one of the reasons I dislike it. There's fantastic research in Africa. Obviously, I'm mm. South African by birth, and I studied in University of KwaZulu Natal, mm. University of Cape Town, Stellenbosch University. And uh, we have fantastic research, which I is probably not uh, very well known by others, but we have fantastic research facilities in Southern Africa mm. and fantastic journals and fantastic research centers. Mm. So I suppose I don't see predatory journals in the same way as you. I don't immediately oh, think of, of course, African yeah. journals. Of course. Because for me, they're, you know, there's oh, African yeah. research are the pioneers of Ebola research, of malaria research. So for me, I see it completely. I don't, I don't think of it like that. But I suppose if you're thinking, if you're thinking of your internal, all the biases, 
yes, I understand that point. I just didn't even occur to me because I, when I think of the, the research from back home, I just remember, you know, the malaria research and all the very important research that's being done. And when the pandemic started, I mean, a lot of the research that uh, the World Health Organization drew on was all the Ebola research on quarantines and how to manage uh, pandemics, epidemics, were drawn from African researchers. And also now with monkeypox, where suddenly people are becoming interested in monkeypox because it's spread to the US, um, spread to a part, not all of the US. Don't, I don't want to scare people listening. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they found one case in one state or something. And all of a sudden people are, oh, there's a new disease. It's not new. Mm -hmm. It's been in Africa since, wait, was the 1930s? Or am I wrong? I think so. I don't know. And there's been a lot of research on it. There's research that's published every year on it for many years now. And obviously they're draw drawing on that research that's being done. Mm. So. Yeah, that's also so funny, just briefly on the whole corona situation, because there's like decades long research have led to the development of those vaccines, which are now, well, also rightly so marketed by those who best know what they're doing, the pharmaceutical industry, but how are they not sharing the revenue and allowing like the global population to benefit from it? Like, I mean, sharing the revenue as there should be like a threshold of how much a company can earn from uh, a virus that basically affects humankind around the globe, hello? And then not sharing the knowledge that has been gathered and accumulated from research labs around the world. And now one company with a few thousand staff members is the only institution and entity that can benefit from that financially. Doesn't make sense to me. But Germany was the only and well the, the major opponent to liberating the the patent. Anyways. Why? Yeah, I don't say I don't know. I think one of the arguments was like, oh, I don't know. They, like those in the South, they don't know what they're doing. They don't have the equipment. That was the only argument. Fear of losing money, basically. <laughs> That's very funny. <laughs> Obviously, vaccine inequity, if vaccine inequity remains, vaccine inequality will just lead to the continuation of the pandemic and more mutations. It seems very simple to me that it needs to, okay. the patents have to be lifted in developing countries so that people can be vaccinated and the <laughs> pandemic can stop mutating and killing and disabling others with long COVID. Um, mm -hmm. But I obviously, the pharmaceutical companies usually control these decisions and not the people. Yeah, and you don't have to be an immunologist to understand that logic of how it would be better. Anyways, let's not go into politics, but <laughs> oh, well, it is very political. So research is always political, correct? Like if you think you're here on neutral ground, PhD soon, let go of that thought. It's it's a, it's a sincere misconception. Research is always political, has been, will always be, but. So just pick your side. <laughs> it is always political, you're right. Which comes back to purpose orientation. So as a researcher, wherever you work, if we just remember why we got into research in the first place, I think that helps also research integrity at large. To stay true to only do research on topics that we actually care about and find useful and important and not those that get the biggest funding. Yeah. Okay, but let's get back to, so yeah, so the whole bilingual, I was going to ask, so Max, uh, Brazil is pretty close, is there any mm -hmm. intersection with Portuguese, just because it's so close as a language to Spanish, and also geographical wise? Oh, I wish we had a Portuguese section, I haven't learned Portuguese yet. Maybe I'll learn Portuguese and in five years there'll be a Portuguese section. <laughs> because I feel so bad for, for the Brazilians. I mean, it's a huge country. So I bet they have hundreds probably of research institutes. So they might be their own happy community altogether. And then there's Angola, Mozambique, and Africa. 
of course, Portugal, tiny country, but mm -hmm. still, well, not so tiny, but relatively. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, I was wondering, like, and then in Latin America, it's the only country, pretty big one, but the only country that speaks Spanish, uh, Portuguese. So are they always the the others, or is like there's no is there a knowledge exchange between the Portuguese community and the Spanish speaking community? Thankfully, a lot of Portuguese, uh, a lot of Brazilian academics speak Spanish. So it's a lot of our peer reviews are Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's Portuguese speakers. Um, we have published work from Brazil before, but in Spanish. Um, yes. So And so we occasionally, I work with people who are in Brazil. Uh, and but is there a lot of uh, interaction? Not as much, obviously, because of language barriers. But we do work. We do have uh, some Brazilian peer reviewers because we try to make sure our peer reviewers and our editorial committees are as diverse as possible as we can possibly make them. Mm. Um, so yes, there is some exchange, but obviously not as much as we'd like. Mm. But then maybe I will learn Portuguese. Next, and there will be a Portuguese section in the journal. Okay, wait a minute. So, what languages do you speak currently? English. I, I speak English, Spanish. Afrikaans, which is like Dutch. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, wait, some Zulu. When you, you're like you South Africans often say that it's like Dutch, but isn't it like still like how close is it, is it to do? And I know you can understand each other, but is it like Norwegian and Swedish? I don't know. Oh, I don't. I don't speak Norwegian or Swedish, so I couldn't even I answer that question. Didn't. And I can't when I, with Norwegians, but when I go to the Netherlands, I can order I can order off the Dutch menu because I can read the Dutch menu. Right. But I struggle to hear people, but I can read. Oh okay. Because a lot of the words are the same root. Mm. All right. Well that gives me an understanding. Okay, so Afrikaans. And then I can speak some Zulu because I'm from Durban. And in Durban, that is by cousin Natal, and I went to public school. And so we started learning Sulu, I think, from our eight. Oh. And it was compulsory till we were 15. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can speak some Zulu, and then I can I can speak a tiny bit of Swahili, though I must be terrible now, but mostly because I speak uh, Zulu. Once you learn one Bantu language, you can kind of uh, tag the others onto each other. I think that's a bit like the Latin languages. And then I, and I speak Spanish because my husband is Mexican. Oh. So Spanish is my second language. And that also explains why I moved to Mexico. My yes, husband. that explains why all of a sudden I live in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, where life takes you sometimes. Yes. Um, okay. So coming back, maybe however briefly or long you want, so with your research in trauma and violence against, violence against women, and we already talked about how you now sometimes look into research that's coming through as submissions. So you feel still that you're adding with a purpose to, to, to like, yeah, to, to shed light on these issues, to help women and people who experience trauma to but for societies to learn around these topics and to better equip themselves to, uh, is it to build resilience because the violence will always be there or is it to, to prevent a little bit of both? Do you feel you still have like a stake in the game of the work that's been done on the ground? So I have a PhD, like I said, in a culture of violence against women and it's a, and a psychological impact. That's what my, I think that's what my dissertation was called. I was trying to remember. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then I worked in research for a bit and then I did a postdoc, like I said, which was on citizenship rights of women in Zimbabwe mm -hmm. and same-sex relationships of women in South Africa. And then during my PhD, I also had a Margaret McMara education grants from the World Bank, they, their NGO, mm -hmm. uh, and, and NRFs. And I worked with a fantastic organization uh, called Sisters for Sisters, 
in mm. Cape Town, which was made up of um, African immigrants who also survived the domestic violence. And I developed a support, uh, support group program and we piloted and I wrote, you know, a manual a book and then we piloted it. Um, and then I also worked as a suicide counselor at Lifeline mm. for a bit as well, for a bit, a bit is like two years. <laughs> well, a yeah. um, and so I, I did a lot of developments, we were development volunteer community work. In my 20s, I'm now 35, most of my 20s was spent doing that, majority of it. Um, and then I decided, okay, let, what will be my next adventure? Um, I'm going to come to Mexico. I married my partner and I started this job. And I'm, also, I'm involved in research and a lot of our research is on social issues, the stuff I care about. So I still think I'm involved. And things I care about, I'm just on the other side, no? Yeah. So the other side of, uh, so my name's not on anything, but I'm on the other side of put, putting it through peer review, uh, typesetting it, yeah. coding it, uh, putting it up, things like that. So I'm so involved in part of it, I think. Yeah, but, for sure. I just, I'm asking because you've been so passion driven with your research and do you feel content and that you have a feeling of accomplishment at the end of the day and at the end of the week that you still contribute to what you care about? By like, do you feel the impact that you have with the kind of work you're doing today? Oh, that is a very few. I feel like we're in therapy. It's um, a bit of a question. <laughs> no, it's good. I like it. I like it. <laughs> You could have another career as a therapist, Joe. Uh, this is an important, this is a good question. I think um, because you do, like, let me answer for you. You do have an impact from the other side of the things. <laughs> I mean, just like, you know, being aware of that also, how you now have a sort of power position or, and also with the experience from the, from the occupations you had before, um, you have the insight, the necessary insight into the topics and the, the scenarios. And now the opportunity to have and curate the research output to, to allow it to have its own impact to society and to inform the stakeholders on the ground, isn't it? Yes, I suppose I would not describe myself as having a power position. I take the bus. <laughs> well, power can be I like that. I like that. Energy. I'm going to start telling people I have a power position. But I like that. Um... <laughs> you have a yes. responsibility. I mean, it sounds so. I mean, you have. You know what I mean. I mean, power is not necessarily a bad thing. Like, I'm just teasing you. Um. Yes, I agree. I'm doing. I'm doing things that matter. I'm also a bit of a generalist. I'm interested in different things, and I'm interested in research. And I feel like research has different uh, impacts, and there are different parts of research to be involved in. And just, just you know, you should no one should feel they're less important because they're not the the PI, the principal investigator on every paper. Everyone who produces a piece of research and the people who help get the research published, mm -hmm. the people who work at the journal, are just as important. Mm -hmm. Research is incredibly important, and so I just I believe in research as just almost like a faith. <laughs> That it has the power to change, you know, governments and lives and people, and that anyone who is part of it in any small way is doing a significant part. Sure. Yeah, the power and also the responsibility, because like when every crisis, politics turns to science, like for help. Okay, what do we do now, researchers? And the research goes, <laughs> well, we do either that or that. We can't really say for sure because that's not what we do. <laughs> but like, anyways, but yeah, as you said, I think that for sure. I mean, there's there's certain things we actually do know. Climate change is real, it's human made, so that's a fact. I don't know why there's still denials, or maybe there's not denial. Like I saw this funny comic strip the other day where it went from like, no, it's not real, to, oh maybe, yeah, maybe we caused it after all. And then like, like look at it. We both know <laughs> before that. I believe that we can still turn things around. 
but that's another discussion. So yeah, it's like I also think as researchers and as a scholarly community, we have a responsibility to society to serve. And everyone in the game, all the research service units and publishers and funders and editors, like all of us have our part to contribute, our role to play, to execute that responsibility and to inform people and policymakers on how to steer people, not to screw the planet fully. <laughs> Boys are beats. <laughs> <laughs> right okay <laughs> let's let's end on a lighter note than this good any suggestions where, where are the next like okay so what's your current plan you you've spent four and a half years give and take four years in one month sorry well <laughs> this is more than four years so are you gonna stay for another four years Oh, we'll see. It's not that you're actively seeking somewhere else. So we will see. the community can still count on you to continue curating and facilitating. I'm, I'm always involved. We will see what I do. I don't know if, what I will do in the next few years. I will probably still be here. <laughs> okay, I'll check on you. How about, okay, let's, let's open a wish list. Or to, okay. if you had three free wishes for... For the position you work in, what will it be? You could implement it like tomorrow. For a, a new, if I have three wishes, what are my wishes? For a new job or a new field? Oh, for what, where you're working at now, like for the journal to, to like probably to add another language, like Portuguese to your. Oh, to add Portuguese, to get an assistant. I work far too much. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so please, uh, those are two things. That's it. That's it. I've got two. Those are my two wishes. <laughs> you know, third one. You have three. You have three. Oh, I have a third one. Oof. Not very good at uh, wishes. Let me think. Um. Ooh. Nobody's believing in the oh, anymore. So people are freely choosing based on the relevance of the journal and the, the venue for their research output maybe more people submitting articles i say that but then you know i have 22 right. manuscripts in my system at the moment and i'm <laughs> trying to allocate them but yes probably the third one more manuscripts more manuscripts that are good so a team and maybe some uh, some some better automation of system like the system that you're working with Yes, maybe maybe another employee <laughs> in Portuguese <laughs> and maybe better manuscripts. Okay, so can well just manifest and will come your way. Maybe not tomorrow, <laughs> but maybe in a week from now. <laughs> <laughs> there's research. You a psychologist, you should know this. I heard there's research about manifesting. I don't every time I see anything about life coaches and that manifesting true. and things regarding that on Instagram or anywhere else I groan inwardly inside and part of me dies <laughs> and whenever people ask me what I do and I what what is study they tell them I have a PhD in psychology and then they ask me if I'm a life coach part of me dies I, I, <laughs> yeah, okay but I, however I think it's just that some of these coaches get it wrong with how manifesting works because you still have to do the work. So you still have to add to your grant proposals or to your budgeting like you need an assistant year after year. Maybe in three years you'll get your assistant. Maybe in just next month. I don't know. So it's just like having the goal just like clear in front of us. Uh, like that's what I'm practicing now. I can't recall any. Anyways. We have more on that in future episodes. <laughs> and apparently there's extra research about it. So it works. Okay. We can discuss we can discuss it in private and laugh and laugh with it. <laughs> we can do that. I'm sure I'm sure it is you know, uh, engineering your cognitive behavioral thoughts, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy is a thing that works. So I'm sure from that perspective, maybe it works. But it's I 
I don't really, I'm not a fan of uh, hippie, you mm-hmm. know, loopy uh, manifestation using the power of the secret kind of stuff. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It upsets me. I... It upsets me that people pay for that when they should go to a good therapist and help them work through their problems. Yeah. Not their problems, just anything. Everyone needs therapy, in my opinion. Where everyone could be more psychologically healthy. Sure. Right. All right. So we have a vision for you and <laughs> which list. Okay. Um, so thanks, Sarah. It's been it's been a fun conversation. And a lot of discussion points raised for the listeners and us to continue talking about. We'll welcome back anytime if you want to chat again on record. And we can also have a coffee and connect situation, just the two of us without any listeners. <laughs> Fantastic. And it's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank, you so Thank you so much, Joe. It's so great always talking to you. Muchas gracias. Um, gracias. How do you say goodbye again? Oh, whenever I try to speak Spanish, yes. Italian pops up. That's okay. I speak no Italian. So it'll be the same. Ciao.